I was in the United States Air Force, initially the Army Air Force, and then the Air Force, and I retired from the Air Force. I'm a full colonel, retired. World War II, I, I started out, let's see, uh, Langley Field, Virginia, and from there went to flying school in southwest United States, in Arizona, New Mexico, and then to Lincoln, Nebraska, <clears throat> got an airplane, B-24H, and then left Lincoln, Nebraska in the latter part of 1943 on the southern route to England. And into England we went to a facility or a base which was called the 70th Depot, and the 70th Depot was a facility where they gave you two or three days to a week of training in the techniques used in England for flying and what procedures and all that kind of thing. Then from there, you were assigned to a group that had lost most of the aircraft in the previous three or four weeks or a month. So it was sort of an interim place before you were assigned to a base. In my case, I was assigned to the 389th Bomb Group, which was stationed at Hethel. When I graduated from high school, <clears throat> I had a part scholarship to college. I wanted to go to Notre Dame. Mother said, no way. Well, you'll have to go to school at night. You had to go to work. My mother was from the old country. My father was from Ireland. So I was very, very disappointed. <clears throat> I had no trouble getting a job. <clears throat> now, mind you, this was 1936. The job paid $8 a week. And I was a delivery boy, you name it, clean up and all that kind of thing. And that's why I, I went to work at that time. While I was delivering jewelry one day in 1938, 30, 30, <coughs> excuse me, 38, on the second floor of the Customs House in Philadelphia, there was a large paper mache man in a blue uniform with a saber and all that said, so you want to fly? And I stood there looking at it. It was at Al Randolph Field, Texas. And, all be, and, and behind me, I hear this voice say, you make a perfect pilot. Why don't you enlist in the Army, in the Army Air Force? And I turned around and said, I got a job. I, I had no reason to join the military. Took my name and address, and I delivered the jewelry and went home. One week later, knock on the door on a Sunday, and there's this sergeant, not in uniform, in civilian clothes. And he says to my mother, your son wants to enlist in the Army Air Corps. And I almost fell over. So I didn't believe these. they signed the papers. I wasn't old enough. So they signed the papers. And one week after that, was the whole thing only took two weeks, I was down at the train station in Philadelphia waiting for a train from Pittsburgh to take me to Langley Field, Virginia. We wind up in Langley Field, Virginia. The train pulled right into the base. And uh, we all piled out. There was about 60 and lined up. And as my first first inkling or first feeling of what the Army is going to be like. Now, mind you, it was Army Air Force. There was no Air Force at that time. So I learned a lesson right then and there while we were standing up because this corporal, sergeant, a corporal, military corporal, he was, he was old enough to have been in a Philippine insurrection. He was a corporal. And he says, can any of you gentlemen type? Well, I made a mistake there. I said, I can. And uh, I became a clerk in what they called the GHQ Air Force at that time. My first payday was $21. My first payday was $2.21. I was going to send my mother $5. I didn't have any money because everything you got was jawbone. Jawbone is what you have today called credit. You didn't have any money. You went to the beer garden, cost you a dime, charged it. Went to the movies, cost you a dime, charged it. We had a commanding officer at the base that was my, I got to know, Louis Mowry. 
And he was old enough at that time, now mind you, this was 1938-39, he was old enough that, that he couldn't get involved in any of the tactics for a war or anything like that. And he said to me, son, everybody's son, you're um, never going to get anywhere in the service unless you're an officer. He said, I'm going to see you go to Randolph Field of Flying School. I said, you are? He said, you have to pass a physical and take some tests and so on. So anyway, that was the beginning of my career basically from then where eventually I went on to a few bases, took the tests and all those kind of things. I was transferred to Barksdale, to um, Albuquerque, New Mexico, Kirk, Kirkland Air Force Base, and went through bombardier school, got, got commissioned a second lieutenant. And then from there, we went to Tucson, Arizona, I was, bombardiers, and we were matched up with pilots and navigators, and we became a crew, and we stayed at Shreveport, Louisiana, I mean at uh, Kirkland Field, uh, at Tucson, Arizona. The training had to do with operating a bomber aircraft, and the, uh, the enlisted men, there's 10 crew members on a bomber aircraft, and this, this was a B-24, and <laughs> excuse me, of course, there were B-17s. However, the B-24 and B-17 had the same crew, basically, same number, 10 men, 10 crew men, pilot, co-pilot, navigator, and bombardier, and then you had six airmen, one, one an engineer, one a radio operator, and they also manned the guns on the aircraft. We were lined up, I think it was and they had one of the crewmen, airmen, radio operators, holding this monkey in his arm. A little monkey. I don't know what kind it was. So I said, what, where did you get a monkey? And he said, he bought it for a dollar. And he said, what are you going to do with it? He said, we're going to take it with us. We're going to take it to England. And now you're not. Bob said, we're going to take a monkey with us to England. Anyway, we took off and went to West Africa, West Africa, Morocco, Morocco, and England. We were in West Africa. They had Sanganese guards. There's these big black, very big guys. They were French. But they were, they were the guards in the airplane. They were guarding the aircraft. Now, the story goes that they got the monkey and they ate it. They barbecued it and ate it. Now we're in England. Okay, go to the 70th depot. We're signed at 389th Bomb Group after we had some transition training, had to learn the rules and so on, and started to fly missions. In January, that's, we, we, we arrived there in January. In January, from some unknown reason, it's been my whole life, I'm called up base operations. The operations officer was a first lieutenant, a captain, and he takes a first lieutenant bar. The difference between first lieutenant and second lieutenant is a gold bar, V of these, a silver bar, and he takes a silver bar and pins it on me. You're promoted to first lieutenant. I couldn't believe it. I, why me? Why not the pilot? It's his crew, co-pilot and so on. So I go back to the hut we lived in. With the, crew. the officers lived three or four to an Eastern hut, Japanese, anyway, and in sections. And I walked in, I still couldn't believe it, I thought it was a mistake. I walked in, and I yelled out, attention. And they looked at me and said, kids have been drinking. I said, no, attention, I'm a first lieutenant, you guys are all second lieutenants. You were an answer to me from here on out. I was kidding, actually, because I, I know right. But anyway, it was a lot of fun. The first one was a, what we call a no-ball mission, which is which were targets in France. They would be, basically be airfields, the German airfields in France, and or railroad yards, marshalling yards, factories, and that kind of thing. And they're very sure, basically, by the time you take off and form, get in formation, with your group. A group has about 36 aircraft. They fly across the English Channel, drop your bombs in France, and come on back. They're very short missions. Short missions meaning, well, no, the flying portion of it's short, three hours. But you're up from about two or three in the morning getting ready, brief flight, aircraft, all that kind of stuff, because that extends the whole day. The second mission was a mission that really was intriguing because went to Berlin. 
Now, Berlin was a target that everybody dreaded prior to us getting there because it was a long mission. It was eight hours from the base Hethel to Berlin. Now, when you, that wasn't the first time we'd see a target. We studied targets. When you weren't flying, you studied targets. The crew members had jobs to do. The gunners had to take care of their guns. I had a bomb site to worry about, which was top secret. And so Navigar had all the charts and all. So it wasn't like you didn't know what to do. You knew what to do, but you never did it. So we went to Berlin. First of all, you had to take off and, and get into a formation to fly. And that was over bunchers or radio facilities. And you circled around, got above the clouds, basically. You never let them stop you and got into a formation. And you took off and joined another formation and another formation to go to your target. They may not be going to the same target you're going to, but you knew where you were going. Well, you see there, there's three airplanes, three airplanes, three airplanes. That there was normally 12, 12 to 18 aircraft per squad and so on. And on, on going into to the target, you, you in the formation, you dropped your bombs on a lead aircraft. The lead aircraft is, was set up by a squadron and group as the best qualified plane in that outfit. They were the best, and they knew where they were going, how they were going to get there, and all that kind of thing. When the aircraft leave the English Channel, get to their altitude, they're flying toward the initial point. The initial point is a designated point that the navigator has to get that aircraft to. We study this beforehand. We don't pick it out of crew. And it's usually a point somewhere that is easily identifiable so that not only can it, for the navigator to try to find, but for the bombardier because he runs his bomb run from the IP to the target. Now we get back to the formation. The formation's in real close. The pilot's responsibility is to get the aircraft to the IP. Say we're going in at 25,000 feet and the bombing is going to be at 20,000 feet. All he has to maintain is airspeed and altitude. When he gets to the IP, he turns, and the navigator is responsible for the route. When he gets to the IP, they turn the aircraft over to the bombardier. When it gets to the I, you get to the IP, you, from there to the target you're aiming at, say it's an airfield or a bomb, I mean a factory or whatever, when you get to say 25 or 30 miles from that particular target, you should pick up the target in the, with the bomb site. If you have weather or something like that, and then the decision has to be made by the lead ship. The lead ship usually has rank, a colonel, a general, or so on. He's making the decision for the whole formation. We get back to, to drop the bomb. They simultaneously toggle their bombs out. You're carrying 4,000, 8,000 pounds of bombs, or you're carrying 20, 100 pound bombs, depends. You're carrying assorted bombs, fire bombs, the idea, the, the British came with the idea of bombing using fire bombs because the demolition bombs, <coughs> the big 500 pound bombs basically, would, would, would be to demolish the building or the runway or whatever. Then when it does that, the fire bombs, which you carry also, sometimes a mixed load, sometimes nothing but fire. The fire bombs, when they hit the ground, they burst into flames. They're 100 pound bombs. Now, you're in a formation. You're tight, you're going in, you're doing everything, right? You're bombing the city, too. And you're bombing people and houses and everything else. The target may be there, but there may be houses, hundreds of houses around with people in them, workers and so on. Well, you had to be debriefed. And you, de you were debriefed in sections, intelligence people, officers. They debriefed the pilot navigator. They debriefed separately me and that, uh, me and the co-pilot. And they debriefed the crew members separately. 
the reasoning behind the deep breathing was what happened, what you see. Now, if one fight, if one bomber shot down another, a fighter, for example, and it was verified by another crew that was out there, then that would, he would get credit for shooting a fight, shooting a, 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 a fighter aircraft down. It had to be verified. But the reason for the separate intelligence briefing was to make sure that you're all saying the same thing. What did you see? What happened here? What happened there? Then there also were people got wounded and they could take them off the aircraft. Aircraft was damaged. All that had to go in. You know, that was the end of the mission. I was, everything was done for that mission. And we went to the company, we were toasting each other, saying, well, we went to Berlin, how about that? And most guys didn't get to ever fly that far. And what, that was the longest mission that we flew at that time. We get a call from the CO, commanding general's office, want to see us, the pilot, navigator, and me. Oh, maybe we're going to get a medal. We went to see him, they chewed our ass out. We missed Berlin. I said, well, how could you miss a city? You're going for a factory in a city and all that. And the reasoning after a whole smoke cleared and whatever, down the road, what happened was when you're using a bomb site or radar or anything, you'll want to pick up something that's black and white. And what's black and white is water, a river, a lake or something like that. And you offset from that point to where you want to go or what you want to hit. And if it's there, it helps you get make sure you're on the right track. There was a river, the Rhine River, that went south, southwest to northeast so in, in Berlin, on the outskirts. We used that, the navigator and I, as a point of recognition to make sure we're heading the right direction and whatever it was. And what happened, the Germans did, they put cables across the river at this narrowest point and put camouflage across the cables, which were like canvas. We didn't see the river. So when we dropped the bombs and so on, we thought we were where we were, and we weren't. D-Day, I was transferred to Gerald Vivian's crew who was a lead crew, PFF, he was a captain and so on. I was taken off of um, Vince, Vincent Courtney, he's the one at Duke, Duke University and so on. I was taken off the crew right before D-Day. I had, had no idea, I said, well, a, a promotion, got a, a different crew, lead crew and so on. On the 20th of June, we were leading <clears throat> a mission, we were leading a whole formation maybe 60, 70 aircraft, and we were going to an oil refinery in Polish, Germany. And if you look at the map up in the northwest corner of Germany is Polish. It's right on the North Sea, basically, in the area there. And we were to bomb that, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> bomb that target. That distance was the same distance as if you were going to Berlin. If you look at the map, Polish is here, and Berlin's there, same distance. And we we're going to that particular target. Anyway, when LeMay came over, we had new new tactics. We flew at 15,000 feet. When we got to the IP to the target, we stayed at 15,000 feet. There was no getting around flak or anything at all. Straight and level, and if there's flak bursting in front of you, you went into it. That was the new deal. We were going to hit the target and so on and so forth. So what happened to us, I was, we were in the lead aircraft to look out the pond, whatever it was. We had a flak burst that knocked our number three engine completely off the aircraft. The aircraft is flying that way, one, two, three, four engines. Number three handles the hydraulic fluid and all that kind of stuff. It hit, boom, all of a sudden our oil's pouring out and everything else. So we have all of it, if you can get to them, to go to. Otherwise, you have to bail out, crash land, or whatever. So, Paulus we're out there. We're, maybe, maybe we can make Sweden. 
Well, we weren't too we weren't too far from Sweden. Sweden was off to the left, and uh, we were practically on the North Sea, basically. So, but we were, we had lost our hydraulic fluid. We could not get the wheels down and whatever. So we said we're going to go and one of the owners was an air base, a Swedish air base called Malmo, Malmo, Sweden. If you look at the map, you'll see at the bottom of the map, Malmo. And we did get there, we got there. Now, the problem we had basically, and everybody else did that went into uh, a neutral country, was the Swedish had fighter aircraft. I don't know what they call it, what their number was. And they would be up protecting their country from the German fighters, which were, well, Germany was right, right, right out there, from chasing aircraft and shooting them down, or you were very susceptible to being shot down when you were coming into land. Because, you know, when we came back to England a lot of times, the fighters that came out of Norway and France would come, come up and shoot you from the back and so on, all kinds of tactics. Well, anyway, we go into Malmo, Sweden, and we crash landed. We couldn't get the gears down. And we, no, nobody was hurt or anything. We were go we through technique here, bracing the aircraft. And uh, Swedish uh, grass field, there was no runways. The aircraft piles up on an embankment. Uh, that, that was because it was a fighter field. And the event that the fighter aircraft, that was Swedish fighter aircraft, if they had any problems and whatever or not, they didn't worry about running off the runway. They didn't have any runways, grass field. Swedish officer, come, they come out to them with guards, and uh, we had been told one of a part of one of your briefings is that you destroy any secret material maps. You take the bomb site and you throw them out in the water and all that. We didn't get a chance to do any of that, so it was all in the aircraft. The equipment in the aircraft, you, you, you knocked hell out of it. You did everything you could. For instance, they have little laxes on a fuselage inside, and that's there in the event that you landed or crash landed and the aircraft was on fire or something, and you couldn't get out through the door underneath or hatch or so on. You take the line and you chop the fuselage and got out. I mean, that was to help you. I used that uh, uh, hatchet to try to de demolish the bomb site. We didn't have a Nord bomb site. Then we had Sperry bomb site. And the Sperry bomb site is fastened to the fuselage of the aircraft. You couldn't do it, you couldn't destroy it. Well, the clear blue comes as Lieutenant Colonel in uniform, like regular uniform, from American Legation. And he comes out there with two sergeants and welcomes us that we weren't hurt, damaged. The aircraft, they photographed the aircraft, they had cameras. And the reasoning for the photographing it was to find out whether or not that aircraft maybe could have gotten back to England. We're in a neutral country. And uh, we spent two days in interrogations by the Swedes and by the American vacation people. It really surprised me. And they did a very thorough job. Then they put us on a train and they sent us, our crew, to Ratvik, Sweden. Ratvik the town 75 miles north of Stockholm. And we got up there and we're in a tourist hotel. We didn't have any money. What we did do, the American legation told them to send us to Haverdashery, which is a, a Haverdashery, you know, you close store in Fallen, which is the town next to where we were. And we went to a drugstore, um, Haverdashery, and we got outfitted with clothes because we had our flying suits and we were dirty and all that kind of stuff. We were internees, and internees, according to the Geneva Convention, could not return to, to war. We could not go back to England or get out of there or anything else. That was war, and that was the rules of the deal. Now, also, Sweden thought that by cannibalizing the aircraft that weren't damaged, that they would get the airplanes. They didn't want any bombers, they didn't want the hell to do with them, but they did want P-51 aircraft. The American government, they cheat. They offered them 50, 50, 51s, P-51. They never got them. They got 
P-38, which is an obsolete fighter. My wife did not know I was there. She never knew. All she got was, like a thing, she got a wire, two stars on it, and said, we regret to inform you, your husband, the first lieutenant John B. Connor is missing in action. That's what, you, that's what people were got. The same wire was sent to if you were killed, but didn't say that at that time. More information will be given to you later. So we, nobody knew where I was and what my status was. What the, what the 8th Air Force did, what the American Flyers did, was they took B-24s and took all the turrets out, all the guns out, and sealed them up inside, uh, took all the armor and everything else, and they called the aircraft a C-87. They painted them green. I don't know why, but they did. And the object was that they would fly out of a base in Scotland that wasn't on the map. It wasn't on the map. It was an American base in Scotland. And the idea was you leave, you fly into Sweden at night. It wasn't far. You fly into Sweden at night, land at the airfield in, St in Stockholm, and taxi over to, to uh, an area on the far side of the field. And we, in turn, were supposed to leave the hotel, get on the train, and go to Stockholm, and get to that place on the field, and get in that airplane or airplanes and take off a fly toward the North Pole so we avoid the fighter bases in Norway and come down into Scotland to this airfield. Now, when we went on the train from the airfield, from the hotel down to Stockholm, we, the, when the train stopped, it was like a, what do you call tra uh, um, train, stopped at different stations. Mm -hmm. And at certain stations there would be somebody from the American legation there that would tell somebody on our plane, on our train, go, I mean go to the next station, no, start, get off, we were going back to the hotel. It wasn't safe. We did that three or four times, so we never knew whether you were going to go all the way or not. So you get down there, and you could only see 87s. Now C-87s didn't have any seats or anything in them, they had boards on either side, and you sat facing each other, 28, 14 and 14. No parachutes, two blankets, and you flew up toward the North Sea. Got on a train, went to Liverpool Station in London, and the object there was to go back to the base that you left, in my case, Ethel. I got distracted somehow away from the group, See, we were all in civilian clothes. I had no identification to show who I was. And uh, went to the men's room. And MP came up beside me and says, uh, Hey, Yank, you're a Yank, aren't you? I said, I'm a bird. Yeah, I'm, what, where, why aren't you in uniform? I said, What's, let's see your identification. I didn't have any. So I was arrested. And, uh, I sent him to American Legation in London, and they gave me an ID. And the ID was a piece of paper saying he's on official business, no picture with my thumbprint, which is worthless. They said, well, you go to PX in London, get yourself a uniform. So we know who the hell you are. I'm going to the PX in London, get uniform, I get arrested again. Anyway, eventually, I got back to my base and Left, everything's gone. When you're gone, missing in action, and you're gone, whether you're dead or whatever it is, your footlock or whatever you have, all your clothes are gone through, whatever. The flying stuff they keep for other people that are still there. Anything that may be personal letters or anything like that. Because some of the guys had girlfriends and that kind of thing. They took all that and destroyed it. 